certainly glad I chose not to sing this morning. Susan had me down to sing, and I don't like to sing before I preach because I have a tendency to get hoarse. So I asked the Lord if she, she would bring the music this morning. I'm really glad. I could really feel the spirit in that. And by the way, I'm wearing my Century 21 jacket. And the reason I am, and I want you to know there's a good reason why I am, because I have been designated as an ambassador for Christ, and I'm not selling real estate, but we are giving it away. And if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, you can take title to one of the most wonderful pieces of property. It, and actually, actually, it's out of this world. That's it. <laughs> His property is out of this world. The Holy Spirit will give you the seal. It will bear witness with your spirit. Heaven sounded sweeter all the time. And you know, the older you get, that is so true. You, you finally get to the place where it's just kind of like, I've had all of this I want. I was talking to Billy and Betty. I've known them so long. When I first met them, they were in their early 20s. And I used to tease them, you know. And I said, well, you girls about ready for your Social Security, aren't you? And they was like 23 or something. And you know what? It ain't going to be long now. I mean, that used to be a joke, see. But, you know, after you, it seems like when you're young and in your teens, you know, boy, it seems like life holds so much promise and there's just so many things to do and you're just excited about so many things. But when you get about my age, why, you, you look back and you realize that life really is just more or less a series of frustrations and the only things that really bring joy is serving God. And, life, and heaven is sounding sweeter every day. But I'm so thankful for the day that when Rance gets up to make announcements, there's not going to be no bad news. And I believe they'll let him make the announcements, you know, and I can just see him getting up and they'll say, well, this is eternity now. <laughs> and the bulletin says everybody's well, everybody's happy, everybody just, everything's okie doke Yeah, I think that's just going to be wonderful. And that's what's going to make heaven so sweet is that there'll never be the sound of a siren or an ambulance or a police car and There'll never be any doors to lock and nothing to fear. All tears should be wiped from our eyes. You know, I'm so thankful for the choir, and the choir's doing such a good job, and Bill and Susan's working with the choir, and I was a little worried this morning, though, because Susan told them to rise, and, and it looked, I, I, part of them did, and part of them did, and I thought, didn't, and I thought, boy, they're really rebellious this morning. You know, and I was afraid there might be a mutiny, but they, they finally all kind of got whipped in line, they all finally got to their feet. And when they did, they did a real good job. I'm really glad to see our visitors this morning and some of our members that haven't been here for a while. It's just good to see each and every one of you. I'm so encouraged by this good crowd this morning. Our Sunday school is down just a little bit, but it, there are an awful lot of sick people right now. There's just a lot of people with, uh, I think Sharon's sick, and there are just several people that are out sick. And so be praying for those. There's flu or something going around. Now, I always preach uh, topically on Sunday morning. I try to preach evangelistic. But when I start a new Bible study, when I start a new series, and we started on the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 1, and on Sunday mornings, I, I like to, uh, when I first start a new study that way, well, I like to have a Bible study because the Bible study normally is on Sunday night and Wednesday night. But when I start a new book, well, I like to let the whole church get in on the first Bible study. And uh, it's too late. We already had it Sunday night and Wednesday night, but I'm going to do a little bit of reviewing. And I have a reason for that. And the reason is, it's my hopes that uh, perhaps by getting in on the start of a Bible study, some of you might be uh, come interested and want to come to more of them and, and learn what's going on. Uh, boy, I'll tell you what, I just really got a praise report this morning. I thought I was going deep and blind. Uh, Susan gave me a haircut, and boy, I mean, my vision cleared up, my ears unstopped, and got all that hair off, and I was really glad. Usually Raymond's first one noticed that I get a haircut. But I'm really glad for the haircut. And also, I have another praise report. Uh, Danny and Jason scrounged around and got some different parts and, and uh, put me together a computer. Uh, they had an old keyboard somewhere, and, and Danny's sister bought a brand new color monitor, and so I got the old black and white one. And they, they wrecked around and got some things together because they thought it would really help me, and it certainly is a help. And I'd like to say that y'all are really in for it because... And I don't usually work by notes, and the reason I don't is because I can't read my own writing and I can't spell. But with the computer, see, I now I've got four pages, and so, oh boy, I've lost a page. Can't have that. 
it didn't take long. As I said, y'all are really in for it. I've got four pages. Probably won't take very long. But we're studying in the book of Acts that was written by Dr. Luke. He was the only Gentile writer of the New Testament. Highly educated man, only two educated men that wrote in the New Testament, and that was the Apostle Paul, who was highly educated, and Dr. Luke, that was highly educated. And the Holy Spirit inspired Luke to write, of course, the book of Luke that bears his name, but also the Acts of the Apostles. And the Acts of the Apostles, if you will find by reading the last few verses of Luke, you will find that it's just a continuation. And that's the reason a lot of times Acts is referred to the fifth as the fifth gospel. The book of Luke tells what Jesus did here on earth while he was alive. The book of Acts tells what he did from his throne there at the right hand of the Father through his apostles and through his church. So it's still about Jesus, and Jesus is the head of the church. Now, we're not going to get very far, because I'm going to do just a little bit of reviewing, because you didn't miss a whole lot if you weren't here Wednesday night. Turn, if you will, to the book of Acts. I've got a lot of scriptures to read, and I'll tell you where I'm reading from, but I'm not going to take the time uh, for you to find them. You might jot down those scriptures so that when you get home you can read them. Another advantage of the, of the computer that I, I hope will, God will really bless this, is that if anybody wants a copy, if you want to make a notebook, and if anybody wants a copy of all of these notes and scriptures, if you will let us know, they can run you the copies as we go through the book of Acts. And so you can uh, punch these out, put them in a notebook, and then when we get through with the book of Acts, you'll have a complete uh, outline, hopefully, if I don't get so frustrated with the computer and give up on the computer. But anyway, that's my intentions anyway, and I hope that that will be an aid and a blessing to the church. Verse 1, chapter 1, the book of Acts. The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto his apostles whom he hath chosen to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now he says, as he addresses this Theophilus, he said, I have sent you a former letter, a former treatise. Theophilus is believed because in Luke, and if, if you want to, go ahead and turn to that because I think it's important that we do first chapter, first few verses we find here where he addresses Theophilus. Theophilus, it is believed because of the wording, he is called most excellent Theophilus. And the term most excellent is referred to someone in high in authority. High, and, and Theophilus was a, a Gentile. He was a Roman citizen. So therefore, he was high in authority and to believe that he may have been a Roman knight. And it's believed that he was led to the Lord by Dr. Luke and that he was probably wealthy and had agreed to publish these writings of the Apostle Paul and distribute them to the church. Now, that's supposition, but evidently that's what happened because the churches did receive the uh, letter, the document of Luke, and also Acts. And so we're thankful for that. It says, For as much as many have taken in hand, now this is in the book of Luke, for as, many, for as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which we are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them into us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write into the in order most excellent Theophilus. Now we find here that he is writing to Theophilus because he said, I have perfect understanding. Now, the word in the Greek for eyewitness comes from two Greek words, opto, optotai, meaning self, and opsomai, meaning to see. But it's one word is optotai, and the medical term for that is to do an autopsy. 
And of course, he was a doctor. And he said, I took all of the evidence and I did an autopsy to see for myself and you can assuredly believe that what I am reporting to you, O Theophilus, is true and correct. During those days, there were many, many fragmentary uh, writings concerning uh, Christ's teachings, his miracles, his parables, but they were just individual writings, individual letters. And uh, the, uh, the, the writer here, Dr. Luke, said, I examined all of those. I carefully, uh, and being, being a doctor, he would be very, uh, uh, very careful, very scientific, to research it all out. And he said, I examined all of those and I examined the witnesses that knew Jesus and I verified their testimonies that he indeed did teach these things and that he did indeed teach these parables and that he did indeed uh, uh, work these miracles that were worked. And he said, I examined all of the evidence. And you see, Dr. Luke, although he did not know Christ in a in a physical sense. He wasn't on the scene when Christ was here on earth. He wasn't there uh, uh, to see Christ the 40 days after the resurrection. But he traveled uh, several years with the apostle Paul. He had witnessed or had interviewed some of the other apostles. No doubt had interviewed even the mother of Jesus, Mary, because in the book of Luke, he is the only one that gives the account of how uh, uh, Gabriel came to Mary and said that she would uh, conceive and bear Jesus, all of that. And the birth of John the Baptist we have because of his, his careful scientific investigation of all the facts. And he's saying to Theophilus, you can go to the bank on it. I did an autopsy. I very carefully uh, searched out all of these things to be certain that they indeed were and are true. These things that we most assuredly believe. Now, let's go back to the book of Acts. And we're going to get to part of the third chapter. Now, this morning, I would like to discuss the fact of the death of Christ on the cross. And tonight, the fact of the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Now, you might be thinking, what is the importance of discussing or proving that Christ died? It's very important because you can't have a resurrection unless you have a, de unless you have a death. Does that make sense? And please keep in mind that during Christ's day, he raised people from the dead. He raised Lazarus, and he raised a, a widow's son, and, and, and there were several accounts, and we don't know how many hundreds of people he actually raised because all of those accounts aren't recorded. But now all of those weren't resurrections. They were just restorations to life because the biblical term rest, resurrection refers to being raised from the dead never to die again. You see, Christ is the first fruits of those who slept. So he gave, brought them back to life in restoration, but they died again. They later died again. So this morning we are going to study the fact of the death of Christ on the cross. And you say, well, what's the significance of that? Because there was a rumor, there was a theory being taught, and I don't know how many hundred years this has been going on, but I've heard it in my day, that, and it's called the swoon theory. And what they teach is this that Christ didn't actually die on the cross. He simply fainted. They took him off the cross, put him in a tomb, and then the coolness of the tomb revived him. And so then he appeared and passed off the uh, lie that he rose from the dead. Now, we're going to examine this this morning because, you see, it's, it's imperative to our salvation. It's imperative that Christ did indeed die. Now, first of all, we want to take the, the uh, testimony, the witness of scriptures themselves and see what scriptures say about this. First of all, God declares that he would die. In other words, God predetermined, preordained that Christ would die. Revelation 13, 8 says this, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundations of the world. So God determined before the foundation of the world that Jesus would die. He would be the sin offering. 
Shannon asked me something here a few weeks ago when I used that term foundation of the world and didn't know what it understood. Well, it simply means this. Before there ever was a world, before there ever was a universe, the Godhead predetermined the Father so loved the world that he was willing to send Christ to die for the world. Christ was so obedient to the Father that he was willing to come and die, and the Holy Spirit was willing then to come and convict of sin and seal those that believe on Christ and call out a remnant for his namesake. So that's what it means. But it says here that it was already predetermined before the world that he would die. Not swoon, not faint, but that God said that he would die. Then there's the testimonies of those in heaven, the, th the throng in heaven, Revelations 5, 9. And they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nations. So the host of heaven says thou wast slain. Then the Old Testament prophets, their testimony declares that he would be. Psalms 22, 15 says, My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierced my hands and feet. So hundreds of years before the crucifixion, the Holy Spirit told King David to write concerning the crucifixion. And this in itself is a marvelous thing. Because you see, they didn't know at, at the time of this writing, they didn't know what crucifixion was. They'd never heard of crucifixion. Jews certainly knew nothing about crucifixion. The Romans, that is something that the Romans did. The Jews either beheaded or stoned or hanged on a tree. But, and they had the right to put to death. But just before Christ was crucified, Rome took that right away from them. That's the reason after the Jewish uh, uh, council had condemned him, then they had to take him to Pilate to have him put to death, and he was crucified. It says here that he was crucified. Isaiah said, He is a despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. But, the, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. He hath, speaking of God the Father, he hath turned every one, no, we have. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Now, Christ... Now, the Old Testament prophets declared that he would come and that he would die, that he would be uh, crucified with the wicked. He had a thief on both sides, but yet he would make his grave with the, with the, with the rich, and he was buried in a rich man's tomb. Now, Christ declared that he would die. Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. In other words, what Isaiah said must be accomplished. What David said, all the prophets said concerning my death must be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted on. And they shall scourge him, and put him to death. And the third day he shall rise again. Then he declared that he was dead. Revelation 1.18 I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and death. Okay, now that is the testimony of Scripture. But now let's see what the testimony of the Roman soldiers were. Now John 19, 30 says, When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was a high day, 
besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. In other words, it was getting ready to go into Passover and it was against Jewish law for a criminal to hang on a tree during Passover. And so they said, go break their legs. And so the way they would do that, they would take a big heavy wooden mallet or they would take a big iron bar and the word break actually in the Greek means to shiver to pieces. Now imagine that. They would literally shiver their, their shins and their knees and their thigh bones to pieces. They would, of course, couldn't support their weight. They would drop. They would not only suffocate, but be thrown into, uh, be thrown into immediate shock and die suddenly and instantly. So in a way, if you want to call it a mercy, it would be a mercy because normally it would take days for people to die on the cross. But you see, Jesus died so quickly. He died so quickly. When they got there, we find... Now, now, let me go ahead and read this because if I don't, I'll just kind of run off like I do. Then came the, sh the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. Why would he die so suddenly? I'll tell you why he died so suddenly. He told Pilate. Pilate said, don't you know I have the, I have the authority to put you to death, to crucify you? And he said, you can't take my life from me except my Father give you that commandment. Why? Because he's eternal life. You can't kill eternal life. And Jesus said, they don't take my life, but I lay it down. And the Bible says after he, he took the vinegar, then he bowed his head and dismissed his spirit. When they came, they looked the one thief was still alive, no doubt, in terrible agony and thrashing and moaning and groaning. The other thief was uh, moaning and groaning. But when they came to Christ, they said, he's already dead. And I want you to know something. Roman soldiers, those Roman soldiers, had seen death many times. They knew death when they recognized it. They knew they could, they could see that he wasn't breathing. They could see the, the gray, bluish color, knowing that there was no circulation in his body. But notice what happened. Now, and you might think, well, why would this even happen? I'll tell you what happened. They looked, they observed, they knew, they gave the verdict, but he is dead. Their testimony is that he is dead. But look what happened. One of the, Ro and, uh, one of the Roman soldiers, <coughs> then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. We say, well, why would he even do that? Because the scripture prophesied and declared that they would pierce his side. He didn't even know he was fulfilling prophecy. He didn't realize that. Now, Christ was elevated on a cross and it says that he pierced his side. Now, Barnes in Barnes notes, Barnes says that that means with a strong arm and violently violently thrust that thing into his side. Now, since Christ was elevated, the spear would come in and go up into the chest cavity. And that's what, that's what exactly what John described. Now, John wasn't a doctor. He just observed what he, what he saw, and he said, water and blood came forth. Well, now, here's what happened. Barnes, and Barnes note says on page 373 and 347 in in that book, the Gospels. The spear of the Roman soldier was a lance which tapered very gently to a point and would penetrate easily, would penetrate easily. A wound was comparatively large, wound was so large as to admit the hand. Now John 20, 27. Then saith he to Thomas, reach hither thy finger and behold my hands and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless. So it was a large wound because the spearhead would veer out like this. Notice this. It is clear that the spear pierced into the region of the heart. The heart is surrounded by a membrane called the peric pericardium. This, this membrane contains a service matter of liquid resembling water which prevents the surface of the heart from becoming dry by its continual motion. It was this which was pierced and from which the water flowed. The point of the spear also reached one of the ventricles of the heart and the blood, yet warm, rushed forth, either mingled or followed by the water of the pericardium, so as to appear to John to be blood mingled with water flowing together. Quote. 
Jesus died, folks. There's no way receiving the terrible beating that he had received, then be nailed to a cross as he was, and then having a spear of that caliber, a Roman war spear, thrust into his side, up into his chest cavity, into the heart, then the swoon series says that he simply fainted. Can you believe that? Folks, if he simply fainted, left unattended for three days, he would die. But he was dead. The Bible declares he was dead. The Roman soldiers declared that he was dead before they ever violently thrust the spear into him. Jesus died. And you might say this. What the big deal? Why is it so important that Jesus died? I'll tell you why. Because the death of Jesus is essential to our salvation. If Jesus didn't die, we don't have a sacrifice. We don't have a sacrifice. And without the shedding of, shedding of blood, there's no remission. If Jesus didn't die, folks, we don't, we don't have a sacrifice. We don't have a salvation. We're all without hope. You see, all of the animal sacrifices for those thousands of years were just shadows and types. All those sacrifices was nothing more than a finger that points to the Lamb of God that would come and die for the sins of the world. Now, if Jesus didn't die, all of those sacrifices meant nothing. And here's something else. All of those animal sacrifices didn't save all it did was it showed faith that they believed that the Lamb of God someday would come and would die on a cross or die, be a sacrifice to pay for sin. Hebrews 10 said this, Then lo, said I, then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above, when he said sacrifice and offerings and burnt offerings, and offerings for sin thou wouldest not, neither hast pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. In other words, he said, all of those, Christ himself speaking, he said, all of those animal sacrifices you weren't satisfied with. That didn't mean anything. That didn't take away sin. And he said, so I came to do thy will, set the, so that the, the law, all those shadows and type, could be done away with. And he came as the lamb. He came to, to die. That's what he came for. He didn't come to work a lot of miracles and make a lot of people happy and give us a lot of wonderful teachings and a good example to follow. He came to die as the lamb. He came as the sacrificial lamb to die on the cross. Now notice what this. He did die and is the only sacrifice that God will ever accept. He's the only one that God will ever accept. He didn't accept the animals, and he'll not accept your sacrifice. He will not accept anything other than the death of the one that was designated and preordained before the, the, the foundation of the world to come. Look what, he, look what Acts says, 412. Neither is there any salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. He's the only way, folks. He's the only way. He is the only sacrifice that God ever accept, accepted. The only one. Do you know what? When Jesus died and was buried, God set his testimony that he was the sacrifice. Why? He raised him from the dead. As proof positive that he was accepted. In the Old Testament, occasionally, remember the case of the prophet when they contested with Baal? They put the wood, he poured water on it, put the animal on it, he prayed, fire fell from heaven and consumed the sacrifice of the wood and the water. That was God's divine approval on the sacrifice. The resurrection is God's divine approval on the sacrifice. And there's no other name. There's no other Savior. You can't do it. I can't do it. Your mama can't do it. Your daddy can't do it. Nobody can save you. Only Jesus. And if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart, God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now I want to show you something. There was, in the book of Hebrews 10, chapter 26, verse, there was a bunch of Jews that wanted to be saved, but because of the terrible persecution, because if a Jew accepted Christ and it was known, he, listen, he was disowned. 
they would have, hold a, have a funeral service for him. His family would never speak to him again. He would lose his property, his job. He would lose everything. And they believed that Jesus was, but because of the se- severe persecution, they decided they wanted to go back and, and do the, sa- the animal sacrifice thing. And here's what he's saying. The writer of Hebrews says, For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no sac- more sacrifice for sins. In other words, in, in other words, once you have learned and once you know that Jesus is the only sacrifice that God uh, uh, approves, then if you go back, there's no other sacrifice. You can't go back to offering animals again. God won't accept that. Now, before, God would accept it as a shadow and a type. But now that the reality was here, Christ died, he was a sacrifice, he says you can't go back to that anymore. He says, now, you can't look back to that. You can't look forward to that again. Here's what you look forward to. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fire indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Folks, I'll tell you something. It's either heavenly real estate or hell. Either you accept Jesus as your Savior or it's hell. There's no other way. So no other name was given. Folks, Jesus died. It's very important. It's so essential, the fact that Jesus died and paid for the sins of the world. He's our atonement. He made the atonement. God accepted the atonement. It's called the passion. And it says after his passion, after his death, after his suffering and death, then there were many infallible proofs that he rose from the dead. Tonight we're going to be studying the fact of the resurrection. The fact of the resurrection. The word, well, I, I'm getting into tonight's sermon, so I don't want to do this. You come back tonight and hear of the, the infallible proof, beyond question. And we're going to examine those. Absolutely beyond question that Jesus died. It's absolutely beyond question that Jesus rose from the dead. But let me ask you a question. You can't straddle the fence. You see, you may not be hostile towards Christ. You may not be hostile towards God. You say, well, I believe that, Jerry. I'm I'm not calling God a liar. The Bible says that Jesus died, and I believe that he died, and so we're all in agreement on that. Yes, but I want to tell you something. It's one thing to look at the lamb and say, that's the sacrificial lamb. I believe it. I know it. I believe the Bible. I know it's the lamb. I know Jesus is the Son of God. I know all of that thing. That's one thing. But it's something else to go and lay your hands upon the head of the Lamb and say, this Lamb is dying for my sins. That's salvation. See, it's one thing to know that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. It's one thing to know that Jesus did indeed go to the cross and pay for the sins of the world, but it's something else to accept Him as paying your sin debt. It's not enough, folks, that Jesus is the Savior. The question is, is he your Savior? See, is it personal? Have you ever said, yes, I believe he's the lamb that died, and I believe he died on the cross, and he paid for all the sins that I ever did commit or ever will commit? That's one thing. But it's something else to say, yes, I believe that he was the lamb of God, and I believe that he did die. I believe God raised him from the dead, and I, at this point in time, accept him as my sacrificial lamb, and I accept him as dying and paying for my sins. That's salvation. Nothing more, nothing less. It's not Jesus dying in your good works. It's not Jesus dying in your church membership or your baptism. It's Jesus dying and paying for your sins, raised from the dead, you believing and putting your faith and trust in that historical event that happened is what's going to get you to heaven. Let's stand. I don't know your hearts this morning. I don't know who's saved. I don't know who's lost. I don't know who's backslid, who's not. I don't know who's looking for a church home. I don't know any of those things. But praise God, the Holy Spirit does. All he asked me to do was preach. Then the Holy Spirit will do his work. Now, I did my job. The Holy Spirit will do his job. But if the Holy Spirit's dealing with you, will you be obedient to the Holy Spirit? You see, if you're lost, God wants to save you. 
If you're saved but walking afar off, God wants you nearer. But anyway, you follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to tell you what to do. But we're going to sing as you listen to the Holy Spirit as it speaks to your heart. And the church is going to be praying that you'll be obedient to the Holy Spirit.